Jesus was coming in, Jacob did not have any friends or acquaintances, nor did he have a relationship with his family members. Uh, so here was a 39-year-old man left on the street without any money and no place to go. Fortunately, Jacob called me in the evening, panicked, because he had no place to stay that night. And through my contacts, I was able to, uh, to connect Jacob to a social worker who serves returning citizens in Anne Arundel, and we were able to find some housing, uh, very temporary housing for him. The lesson that I learned uh, from Jacob's release is that the Department of Public Safety and Correctional Services does nothing or uh, little of nothing to help returning citizens to return to their community. Basically, they release incarcerated men and women without hardly any resources to turn to uh, when they are released. The message to those released is clear, sink or swim. Uh, now imagine if you had been in solitary confinement for six months or more, 20 to 23 hours in total solitude. Imagine like Jacob, you don't have any family return to and you've been in prison from anywhere from five to 25 years. You most likely have very few, if any, friends on the outside. And because you've been in solitary for an extended time, you are exhibiting symptoms of PTSD, uh, paranoia, nightmares, periods of sleeplessness, bitterness, and a rage for having been treated the way he had been treated. Uh, so we have a, we, uh, Interfaith Action, uh, have written a bill, and we, uh, Delegate Lewis has been our sponsor, uh, to pass a bill to assist people in this transition. They need to come out of prison with an experience of being with other people and with resources to manage by themselves. So this bill, House Bill 67, provides support for such people while in prison so that they can begin to manage once out of prison. We feel very strongly uh, that releasing people directly from solitary confinement uh, is a threat to public safety. Uh, people coming out of prison without any resources, uh, with, uh, it's, it's, not, uh, it's certainly easy to imagine while such people might uh, uh, be angry and may lash out at other people uh, and certainly may resort to a life of crime just in order to survive. Uh, and so uh, this is an important bill uh, it's, a, it's a stepping stone to, to our ultimate goal, which would be to end extended uh, uh, isolated confinement or, or solitary confinement. Uh, and so uh, this bill, HP 67, is uh, top of our agenda this year. It's, uh, it's now in uh, the Judiciary Committee of the House of Delegates, and we'll learn some more about its status and uh, where we hope it'll get to uh, in a few moments. I'd like now to stop and introduce uh, uh, Reverend Dina Van Claveren, who is an Episcopal priest and Jesus devotee, according to our biography, who loves exploring how the good news calls us to live in, in a, into joy, clarity, and freedom that's worth, that is worth the work it requires. Uh, Dina began working with Interfaith Action for Human Rights as part of her work responding to the opioid epidemic in the local community and through various Episcopal church task forces. Her congregation is in Glenwood, Maryland, and has advocated for the humane treatment of incarcerated populations in Annapolis, and has a heart for justice, outreach, and young people. Reverend Van Cleveren is a mother of two teenagers, is married to a hospital pharmacist, and previously served as an associate dean of students at the Maryland Institute College of Arts in Baltimore. Reverend Van Cleveren, love to hear from you. Thank you, Rabbi Chuck. I support this legislation, HB 67, in order to ensure transitional services begin to be offered in the state of Maryland to incarcerated people as they approach their release date. Because I love our state and I love its people and desire for the health and flourishing of individuals and families, businesses, and communities. For the returning citizens with whom I have spoken and worked with, Every single one finds it challenging to adapt to society outside of the prison walls. Learning how to function in society must be so overwhelming, even when there is a supportive family system to surround a returning citizen. I urge our state legislators to step up 
and implement a step-down program that moves incarcerated persons about to be released through a process of preparation, allowing them to develop the awareness they need to function in society, in their families, and according to the expectations of the law. This is even more critical for those who are being released without steady family support to welcome them home, functioning in society without the guidance and support of law abiding family or friends is an exceptional challenge, especially when someone has been kept in confinement. As a pastor and church leader, I advocate for a toolbox of resources to be placed in the hands of incarcerated persons approaching their release dates a toolbox that will allow them to rebuild their lives, rebuild their family relationships, rebuild society and make positive contributions. In the 180 days before release, our prison system has the opportunity to make the most of an important threshold moment in the lives of not only those incarcerated, also in the lives of Marylanders on the outside of the prison system by providing a toolbox of resources such as mental health resources, recovery resources, health resources, transitional resources for relocation, logistics, transportation, and ways to connect and reconnect productively with family and law-abiding support networks, we can provide each returning citizen access to the tools they need to constructively build their lives and rebuild their lives in a stable manner, rather than ejecting them thoughtlessly into a world for which their only preparation is life lived in the context of confinement, violence, disempowerment, and whatever was happening in their lives just before they were arrested for a crime. By providing these tools to those about to be released, we provide society with returning citizens equipped for interaction and ready to work and contribute productively. This will benefit businesses that will hire returning citizens, increasing employee retention and productivity, and resulting in a positive impact on our state's economy. Another important reason to adopt HB 67 is the benefit of the step-down program for the correction staff to properly evaluate readiness for release. Within the 180-day threshold before releasing incarcerated persons into society, the correction staff will be better equipped to evaluate and understand compliance of the person and whether or not they are appropriate for release at that time into society and shore them up where they are lacking. This may add another layer of protection to society, providing a window for evaluating behavior and assessing each incarcerated person's suitability for release into society, rather than releasing unprepared persons into society directly from restrictive housing to encounter the noise and the demands of life on the outside without the tools to navigate the freedom and responsibilities before them. On behalf of families who are preparing for their family member to be released, I strongly urge Maryland legislators to adopt House Bill 67 so that we can move toward a society where justice is restored, providing people with tools to live in better ways once they are released. Thank you so much, uh, Reverend Van Cleveland. Beautiful words. We now turn to Reverend Stephen Tucker, who is the founding and senior pastor of the New Commandment Baptist Church in Columbia. He's a graduate of Crispus Atux High School uh, in Annapolis, Indiana, Ball State University in Muncie, uh, Indiana, and St. Mary's Seminary and Ecumenical Institute in Baltimore. He received a doctorate degree from the Determined Biblical and Theological Institute, also in ba Baltimore. He's currently uh, president of Jobs Coalition, president of the National Capital Baptist Convention of D.C. and vicinity, uh, and board member of the D.C. Students Construction Trade Foundation and Project Bridges. Reverend Tucker, we're delighted to have you here. You need to unmute. There you go. Thank you, uh, Rabbi. I uh, appreciate the invitation to come and support this bill. Um, I, as you know, I've been working in reentry uh, since 1997 uh, when we founded Jobs Partnership. Uh, the original intent of Jobs Partnership was uh, to employ the unemployed, the underemployed, and the hard to serve. 
and the mission was to bring churches and businesses together in order to do that. Uh, in founding that organization, we became connected with Court Services Offender Supervision Agency in the District of Columbia. And we were on the ground floor of their faith reentry initiative. Our responsibility was to help reenter returning citizens in wards one, two, three, and four. And our responsibility was to track them from the time they got out uh, into successful employment. Uh, we did that through the partnership of churches. Uh, we were able to pull together uh, 110 churches. Where we were able to pull mentors from those churches to match uh, returning citizens when they come home and to walk with them for six to 12 months uh, Reverend Tucker, if I could just interrupt. If you could speak a little closer to the mic, some people are having a hard time hearing you. Okay. So if you could speak a little louder or closer to the microphone. Thank you. Sorry to interrupt. Okay. I'll try to use my preaching voice. Okay. <laughs> can Can you hear me now? A little bit, yeah. Okay. A little bit better, yeah. All right, great. Uh, our, our job was to match mentors uh, to the returning citizens, to walk with them, to go to court with them, uh, to work in parole with them until they were successfully re-entered into the community. Uh, are, can you hear me still? Yes, a little louder if you can. Yeah. Okay, all right. Now, having worked in partnership with CSOSA uh, all of those years, I have discovered several things that are critical for assisting uh, returning citizens. Number one, uh, all returning citizens need some kind of help to successfully re-enter their community. They need some kind of help. And also the help should be provided both prior to and after they are released. Um, I have visited Rivers Correctional Facility down in North Carolina several times and talked to the inmates there. I was able to get a group of employers to go to Rivers with me to explain the employment opportunities that they have for returning citizens. That was critical because if you just throw them out on the street without any prior programs, they'll be just as lost as they were when they were incarcerated. The reason why I support this bill is because of that program where they will be able to receive some sort of training, indoctrination, and advice on how to make it on the outside. We have to remember that on the outside, it has changed dramatically. You mentioned that person that was incarcerated for about 20 or 25 years. Things change in 20 and 25 years. And when they hit the street, they need help. They need help before they hit the street, just to let them know that things have changed. The third thing that I want to lift up is the moral obligation that we have to provide these programs. Uh, we have a moral obligation, and that is why the convention that I serve, uh, we are advocating uh, the 60 churches that we have to get involved in re-entry because these are our brothers and our sisters these are fathers of children, and they need a chance when they get out. They've done their time, and now it is time for us to do our due diligence. Technology has made it possible that programs can be implemented prior to their release. We had 
employers talking to inmates while they were in prison to prepare them for employment once they hit the street so that they're not looking all over the place or wandering back to their same communities. And I support this bill. I support this bill because of its obligation uh, to uh, uh, the returning citizen. If we can morally support Ukraine, I want you to hear this. If we can morally support Ukraine and they're across the waters, we certainly ought to morally support the people who were born here. Because I've discovered in working with them that some of them were the sons and daughters of pastors of churches that grew up in the church, that had a moral foundation, had a compass, but they just went wrong. They made some mistakes. And it's really devastating to punish them twice with incarceration and then putting them on the streets with no tools to succeed. So I support this bill wholeheartedly. I, I will do everything that I can within our religious community to support it. And I will support it from the standpoint that this is what we are called to do as Christians. You're muted. Rabbi, you're muted. I'm sorry. My phone was ringing and I turned on the mute and then I put it back. Thank you. It's my uh, pleasure and honor to turn to Kimberly Haven. Uh, her uh, journey as an advocate began when she sought to regain her own voting rights after release uh, from a Maryland prison in 2001. As a result of Kimberly's hard work and support and guidance of organizations and effective individuals, the Maryland House and Senate in March of 2007 approved the Voting Rights Protection Act, which re-enfranchised 50,000 residents, uh, returning citizens who had completed their sentences. Since that time, Kimberly has served as an executive director of Justice Maryland, the Maryland Justice Project, and project director for the Maryland Public Defender's pretrial and bail reform campaign. Since 2019, uh, Kim has been serving as an advocate and legislative liaison for IHR's, IHR's campaign to end the abuse of long-term isolation in Maryland state prisons. So Kim's gonna give us an update on the bill, tell us some more about the bill uh, and where it stands in the legislature. Thank you so much. And thank you everybody for joining us today. It is a, a crazy day in Annapolis. The uh, the topics that are on the floor are insane, so the debate should be um, quite spirited. Um, I'm here today um, in support of HB 67. This bill is critical. I you know I had this whole thing written out of what I was going to say, and then in listening to the speakers that came before me, I have kind of pivoted a little bit. Um, both all of our speakers have talked about the moral obligation. And I say frequently that what we do to, what we don't do for, and what we don't do with the people that we have incarcerated comes back to our community tenfold. What this bill proposes is not groundbreaking. It is not new. It is, however, a public safety uh, mandate. We have already taken care of some of the other constituencies that were problematic for our legislators. This is the last one. I know that Rabbi talked to you about our mutual friend and had we not been there to basically scoop him up, uh, he would have been on the street. And again, what would he have done? Reverend Tucker talked about the world has changed since people were incarcerated. And that is so true. I know people, I personally know people who when they came home were not used to going into a restaurant. How do you order on a menu? How do you use a glass? I mean, these sound basic and they sound simple to us, but they're not. Cell phone technology has changed. You have to apply for a job on the online. You don't have that while you're incarcerated and you definitely don't have it if you're in restricted housing. 
So right now the department will push back and they will say, we are doing this. We are providing reentry services. And they did in fact hire a reentry coordinator that I have great respect for off this issue. They're not doing enough. So if you're going to work with the population that's in general population, you also have to make sure that you include those that we have in restricted housing. Take the services to them. As the speakers before me have said, the idea of reentry begins before someone comes home. How we release someone is what they're going to bring back to the community. If you can imagine living in a six by nine box with nothing but steel furniture, steel beds, toilet, steel sink that's connected to your toilet, and you can't escape the smells, you can't escape the noise, you can't even block out the light, your senses are on overload. And so you're in this space and then they come to you and say, okay, time's up, here's your papers, hit the gate. And what do you do? How do you transition? How do you focus on what you need to do? How do you rebuild your life? And that's what this bill will do. This bill will provide the opportunity for people to reintegrate. The simple things that I talked about, about using real silverware, the simple things that I talked about, about preparing a resume, just because someone is in restricted housing does not mean that they are not able to access the services that the department says that they're providing. Successful reentry begins before they're given their papers and shown the gate. We do have a moral obligation. What we do to them is what they're going to bring home. We need to be in a position where we show grace, where we show dignity. I know that sometimes the pushback that I get all the time when I'm here in Annapolis, which is where I'm right now, I hear, what about the victims? This isn't about the victims. This is about somebody who's going to come home. We never forget the victims. Let's be real clear about that. But what we're doing when someone is getting ready to come home is we're taking them and isolating them right before that point. And so that damage, that trauma, there's no opportunity to repair bonds with family members. There's no linkages, as Reverend Tucker was talking about, to employment opportunities, to mental health. I'm sure that the rabbi talked about the mental health trauma that we know is exacerbated because we know a majority of our incarcerated population come in with mental health issues. And so solitary only exacerbates that. This bill is critical to pass this year. Baltimore City, PG County, I hate to throw them under the bus, but you know, I'm gonna. They are in the news right now for the high crime rates. This is about preventing, as um, Elena Vanko just put in the chat, about preventing future victims. So if we do this right, if we do this better, if we approach it from a position of grace and dignity, then we're setting people up to be successful when they come home from prison. That is our moral obligation. It is also the mandate of our Department of Correctional Services. This bill is critical. This bill will set people up to be successful. And when we set them up to be successful, we set communities up to be successful. This is a way to, as the, I just said, to prevent future victims. This is a way to make sure that someone comes back because they want to come back to their community and be a contributing member of, the, of their community. They want to support their economy. They want to raise their children. Let's let them have the tools before they come home to do that. Let's not further exacerbate any kind of trauma that they've come into, but rather let's address it. Let's make sure that when they come home in the first place they go, and I'll, I'll tell the story real quick. I know we're kind of running at time, but um, when I go into the institutions and I ask people, what are the first things you're going to, first two things you're gonna do when you get home? And inevitably 95% of them will say, have sexual relations with my partner and, um, and go to um, dinner. Well, dinner is great, but how do you order off of a menu when your food has been brought to you on a plastic tray? How do you know when you sit there and you look through a menu that has five pages? We can prepare people. We can set them up to be successful. We can help them come back to our communities. And that is our mandate. Grace, dignity, and the right to come home fully prepared. Let's hold the department accountable. Let's make them do what we know they need to do. This is a huge issue in Maryland. 
HB 67 will move us forward, will make us more progressive in how we treat the people that we incarcerate, how we take care of our brothers, as Reverend Tucker said, our brothers, our sisters, our mothers, our fathers, our grandparents, how we take care of our neighbors. We're called to treat our neighbors as we would want to be treated. This bill will help us do it. Right now, our bill is um, going through an amendment process. We're just changing a couple language, or pieces of language. The bill stays the way that it is. And then it's going to come up very quickly for a vote in the House. Then it will cross over to the Senate and our sponsor there is Senator Susan Lee. So here's my call to action. We need you to call, certainly call, all of the members of the House Judiciary, including um, Judiciary Chair uh, Lou Clippinger and David Moon, who's the Vice Chair. Call every member and tell them that you urge their support of HB 67. And then call your elected officials and tell them that you want them to support this bill when it comes to the floor for a vote. Share this bill, share your support with your networks, with your neighbors, because 95% of the people that we incarcerate are coming home and you don't have any idea who they are. And that's the way it should be. Support HB 67 and let's get it passed this year. I'm gonna turn it back over to um, uh, Rabbi Feinberg so that he can tell you how to continue to stay engaged with Interfaith Action for Human Rights and continue to support the critical work that we're doing in Maryland, in Virginia, in the district and how we are reaching out across the country on this issue. Come be a part of Interfaith Action for Human Rights. Rabbi Feinberg, the floor is yours. Uh, thanks, uh, Kimberly. Uh, just the timeline, what do you think uh, these votes will be taken? I uh, think because crossover is March 21st, that things are gonna move very quickly. The amendments have now been sent to um, Delegate Clippinger. They uh, have also gone to the members of judiciary and they have also come, come over to Senator Lee's office. So Delegate Lewis, who apologizes for not being here, but as I said, the floor is insane today. Um, never knew about ghost guns. Now I know more than I need to. Um, he's going to be reaching out to Delegate Clippinger and put our bill up for a vote in the, I don't know that they're doing a voting session this week. It should be early next week. And then once it's voted out, then we'll be able to start moving it on the Senate side. And we'll reach out to everybody who's on this call to support the Senate action, to offer testimony, written testimony, oral testimony. Remembering that the Senate is in person. Again, that's where I am. Um, right. Come on down. But um, the timeline is going to quicken now. And so IAHR will be sending out regular blasts about how this business, how this bill is moving and we need your support. Thank you. So uh, we should send out, uh, we should make those calls and send those notes uh, to the Judiciary Committee and our own delegates uh, this week, it sounds like, for sure. Hopefully the vote will be taken by next week. You're on mute, Kim. You're still on mute. Kim. You can unmute yourself. Um, Technology works until it doesn't. Yeah. Um, yeah. I Our don't brain think, doesn't work. <laughs> <laughs> I don't think that we will be on the vote list for tomorrow, but we should be on the vote list for, I believe, next Tuesday. But okay. I will confirm that um, this okay. afternoon while I'm here in Annapolis. Okay, so it sounds like yeah, we should make. So we'll be sending out uh, a list uh, to our list uh, to everyone uh, of the Judiciary Committee again, and their con all their contact information, so you can contact them uh, and send emails to them, and if you can call their office, so we'll send the number of their office as well. Uh, and if you can do that this week, that would be great. And if, if and when, and hopefully this will happen, it's passed uh, by the, the full house, then we'll do the same, the same drill when, when it gets to the Senate. Uh, so, I would also ask, if I could, I'm sorry to interrupt, I apologize. Please, um, please. I would also ask um, that they uh, send an email to Speaker of the House, Adrian Jones, who has, who has um, been a supporter of this in the past and who will you know, certainly um, support it again, but we want to make sure that it's on her radar. She's actually on one of my lists to come see um, again today. So, um, you know, again, that's somebody else that we need you to reach out to. I can't see the chat questions 
I'll, um, I'll let you. Uh, so one of the questions, and we'll take uh, questions after this as well. Uh, uh, so one question is, uh, what are the objections of any you are you hearing uh, to the bill? That is, what do we have to counter here? The department. The department wants to maintain that they are already doing this, and we know that they're not. Um, the other thing is there's no way that they really could be doing this when our entire po prison population was basically in restrictive housing for two years. So there's no way that people were being prepared, and yet people were still going over on lock, or they're going in the shoe, however you want to refer to it, and well, they it were seems, not getting these It services. seems if they're already doing it, then they shouldn't object to it. You, you know, think so, right? right? Right. Again, they don't like it when we. If they're doing it, then why would they care about a bill? It says that they have to do it. So they don't like it when we try to tell them what to do, but we know what to do. Um, but no, we have worked with them in the past on this bill, on this issue, and um, this year, I do not believe because there was no um, objection at our at our original bill hearing before the committee. The union did not oppose. And so I'm taking all of that as good signs. But the department they, is where we get in, the pushback. In previous years, the department has always said it will cost millions of dollars to do this. Has that come up at all? Yeah. Um, and again, the fiscal notes is something else that I think advocates need to start looking at. But I think that this bill had a fiscal note as well. And yet when I met with the department uh, to talk about this bill, they were we're doing this in 11 out of our 13 11 out of our 13 institutions well no they're not because we do talk to people in each one of these institutions and we know things are not happening so if you're doing this in 11 of 13 why do you need 30 new employees she couldn't answer that and she said well but i know we need people to be able to escort them from restrictive housing if they're going to go see a social worker well, you would do that anyway. You don't need extra staff for that. You already have staff. You take them to medical, you take them to visits, you take them to the dentist, you take them to wherever. So you shouldn't need 30 new people. And you hired new social workers, and you hired new regional directors of social work. So um, the idea that they need these people is just a way to derail the bill. And we can counter that each and every time, and we have. But the department is where we get the pushback. And that fiscal note is just ludicrous. We support the union. We support the department in getting more people, but not 30 people and not 30 people for this one bill. That's just insane. Yeah. Another question is, uh, Reverend Van Claveren talked about a toolbox uh, I think, you know, one of the things that should be in the toolbox is to tell people what a QR code is. Uh, oh, right. Yep. I've been Again. in restaurants now where they don't hand out menus. They just tell you, you know, scan the QR code. At first, I had no idea what that was about when I first happened to me. So I can imagine someone has been away for some years, but had no clue what that meant, uh, what a QR. So the whole issue of technology. Uh, yes how reliant now we are on our cell phones for so many different things. I would be, would certainly be one thing in the toolbox, I would think I have to be. Any well, other ideas you have, Reverend Van Claveren, about toolbox? I do. We're working uh, in our communities to support refugees from Afghanistan. And I am really appreciative of my colleagues' comments about our, our commitment to the Ukraine at this moment and how that needs to also be mirrored by our commitment to returning citizens who were born here. And so as I think about the toolbox we're preparing for Afghan refugees who are coming into our communities, I'm thinking, why don't we have a toolbox for our returning citizens? There are so many skills and content areas, and I know we cannot teach it all. To do that would be cost prohibitive, I'm sure, but to begin to introduce concepts and awarenesses so that our returning citizens at least have a sense of the lay of the land they can then create their own toolbox. They can decide what do they already know how to do and what do they need to figure out? And we're not even telling them what might be in a toolbox. So when I speak metaphorically of a toolbox, I'm really referring to recovery. Um, from my own experience, we have not done a good job linking folks in recovery or who want to be in a recovery community with those resources. That should be immediately a part of the toolbox because now we are not only punishing people twice, we're punishing them twice 
for what is very much a disease. And we are not providing them with health opportunities, opportunities to be healthy and well. And so I'm thinking of those kinds of toolbox options. Also, how do you access some of the, the benefits of being a member of society? And what are the responsibilities? Um, I know we have parole officers, and I know that, um, that that depends on who you get and how you interact with them. Uh, we need more sturdy toolbox implements for these folks coming out. I would also like to add, and thank you, um, Reverend. I would also like to add to that, that we shortchange people um, just because they've been or are in prison. We don't think that they wanna pursue higher education. We don't think that they want to go back to school and get their GED. And there are programs across the state that are ready, willing, and able to um, help people. Do you wanna get a degree? Great, from prison cells to PhD. Do you want to get vocational training? There's organizations that will help you with that. All of these organizations want to work collaboratively with the department and make those successful seamless transitions. I learned a fact yesterday that is still sitting with me that I don't quite know where to put. And that is that people who are released directly from um, restrictive housing are 12 times more likely to die in the first two weeks of coming home than somebody um, who's not been in prison. Mm -hmm. We need to make sure they're connected with the appropriate mental health with physical health. They're eligible for Medicaid. Let's get them on Medicaid. Let's get them hooked up with a provider, a mental health provider, a recovery program. Um, these are all things that we need to think about, not just as they're getting ready to hit the gate, but we need to, need to make sure that they are implemented long before so that everyone can um, attain them. And the issue of illiteracy, it is a problem. And COVID has really stomped on that to be perfectly blunt because programs had to stop and they weren't using technology they weren't allowing correspondence courses and so all of the prison programs basically ground to a halt we need to also demand and i hate to say this this is not part of this bill but that the maryland state department of education and the maryland higher education commission get more involved in the educate in expanding educational opportunities there's no reason that somebody who is coming out does not have a ged does not know how to read at an appropriate grade level we have the people that are willing to do this this is part of coming home and part of our mandate it's also part of treating people with dignity and in grace Thank you for that. Any uh, more questions? Any more questions? Uh, uh, Rabbi? Uh, uh, Reverend Tucker, please. Yes. I just wanted to piggyback on uh, something that I just heard about uh, the department being the kind of like the brick wall that we're trying to. Uh, a little louder again, but Pastor Tucker. People yeah. have a hard time hearing. Yeah, the department seems to be the one that is uh, posing the most obstacle to what we're doing, it's what I heard. Um, I just want to share this quickly with you. We were working with a returning citizen and we got him a job uh, with a reputable corporation and he got off of work at five o'clock the company noticed that he was leaving early and he was leaving early because his parole officer would not change the time of his appointment so that he would be able to keep his job but also report to him at the same time. And that went on for several weeks and finally the employer called him in and said, hey, hey what are you doing? We noticed that you're leaving early. And so he said, well, I'm leaving early because I have to report to my parole officer and he will not change my appointment time. And so he had to choose between his employment and violating his parole and going back into the prison system. And those are the kinds of things that they face when they come home. Uh, and when I say moral obligation, I'm talking not just about the everyday citizen, but I'm talking about the department as well. Yeah. 
Yeah, and the uh, parole violations and that whole area is a whole, it's a whole topic that we, we will hope to address. It's, uh, it's another area of the criminal justice system in which people are often get ensnared and put back in prison, not for committing a crime, but for just not showing up for an appointment. So um, it's, a, it's an important area. Thank you for raising that. Um, any other questions or comments? Okay, well, I really appreciate everyone coming. We will be sending out uh, another email blast, uh, certainly by tomorrow, uh, with instructions uh, about uh, who to contact uh, to, to marshal support uh, for House Bill 67 for providing transitional services uh, uh, six months prior to release uh, for people in solitary. So thank you so much. Uh, I'd like, uh, Kim, if you could stay on a few minutes, and Eliza, are you still, if you could stay on a couple of minutes, uh, we could have just a really short impromptu meeting, is that all right? Absolutely. Yeah. Thank okay. you, everybody, for joining Thanks, us, and thank you for your support. I want to thank Reverend Van Claveren and yes. Reverend Tucker for their time. Uh, really appreciate your inspiring words. Thank you so much.